personally, personally, sing it personally, sing it out. Sing like you know it. Sing like it's an experience. Sing like it is yours. We 
Can you raise your hands you are expecting? God is here and that's to bless us with the Spirit quickening by. See the cloud already bending, waits to draw the Oh, 
Celebrate like God is here. Somebody to your left and to your right. Turn to somebody to your left and to your right. Say your star has emerged. I hope you know it. That's all. Say your star has gone forth. I hope you are aware. Tell somebody your star has risen. I hope you know it. I hope. I hope you are aware. I hope you are. I hope you know. I hope that. The, I hope you know that the star of your life, the star of your promotion, the star of your glory, shine like your star. Hallelujah. Be seated. Be seated. Let's try to calm down. This should be the third week of the Rising Stars Assembly. So I'm trying to get over the emotion and the excitement of having to have this amazing amazing feast of the stars so I feel the nudging in my spirit that God is about teaching us deep things I don't know how many of you are ready for deep things for God to take you deeper the letter to the Hebrews talks about the milk for the uninitiated for the uneducated, the untrained, for the infant, and talks about bones for the adult. You see, the spiritual life has ages and stages. There is the stage of infancy. An infant is still a son, just a child, just a baby. And that's okay. That infant maybe having the star of rulership going ahead to announce that the king is born but you know as long as the infant remains infant he will do the business of drinking milk and drinking milk and cannot touch anything solid and as long as that endures that infant will not know about the inheritance for which the star of his destiny has gone forth for announcement. One of the things that God is teaching me and drawing my attention to that is so urgent that I share with you is that when we say we are waiting on God, we are not correctly 
correct. That we are not really correctly correct. There's no time you can wait on God because God is ever ready. Now, when the scripture says for those who wait, who hope in the Lord, those who wait on the Lord, that is not a sense of waiting for God to be ready. The Hebrew word that is translated hope or wait, some version of the Bible will say for, and those who wait, but those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. The word wait is not in the sense of the understanding of waiting, for example, you waiting for me to get ready to get dressed. You're waiting for me to get dressed in order to attend to you. That should be Isaiah chapter 40, verse 30, reading from New American New American Standard Bible. Though youths grow weary and tired and vigorous, young men stumble badly, yet those who wait on the Lord. 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 Those, he didn't say for those, yet those who wait. Those who wait. Now, we're trying to look at the word gava in Hebrew. The word that is translated, wait, is gava. And it speaks of eagerly, eagerness. Those who are eager about God. Those who are eager. The first word that gava, gava is Q-A-V-A-H. That is what is translated in English as wait. And so, I uh, want to use that to explain to you that you cannot in any normal situation say you are waiting for God to be ready. So your waiting is not about God not being ready with the resources needed for you to marry. For example, a 12, 13 year old girl Will one day be a mother, every being, everything being equal? And you see, and the girl may be a, an early bloomer. Those who bloom very early and mature at 13, you can just make me say of thinking, oh, this person, how many children do you have? He said, well, I'm still waiting. Uh, you know, I'm waiting on the Lord. I'm waiting for God. That's not correct, you know. A 13-year-old waiting on the Lord. Oh, that's not correct. A 13-year-old is waiting eagerly to grow into the Lord's plan. If you understand me, can you raise your hand? The Spirit tells me I'm going to do some teaching this morning. So I didn't have excitement to stay in the place of worship. The Spirit kept nudging me, move on, move on, move on. Tell them something. So you're waiting for something. It is not every time there is a waiting in a normal situation, it means there is a lack of readiness. It means there is a lack of readiness. It means there is a lack of sufficiency of what is required for time to start. So God will never have to be ready. Otherwise, it will cease to be the God we know. The God we know is the God who is, who was, and who is to come. The God who is perfect and total. The God who is all sufficient. When he announced his name to Moses, he said, I am. I am also refers to I will be. I am also refers to I have been. So what I am today is who I have been and who in a, I will be. So God of today can be predicted as God of tomorrow. His workings may be new, but it does not need new strength. He does not acquire new energy. He renews the strength of those who wait for him. But his strength does not need renewal because he never, he never goes down. So that song today, I had to tell Joy to meet me. I want to share a few things with her on how to sing such a song. Because that song was so beautiful and powerful, but it was like people didn't relate with it. I've been longing forever to have that song as regularly sung as possible. Say your love never fails, never gives up, never runs out on me. That's the perfect description of God. 
It never fails. Never gives up. Never what? Runs out. So when we talk about wait then, it is not about God. Because when you talk, oh, I'm waiting for the pastor to come. The pastor has not yet come. I'm waiting for the president to come to the office. I've not, he has not resumed office since after 40 days fast. He's not strong enough yet. He's not strong enough. It speaks of the insufficiency, the littleness, the potentiality. God, God does not have potentiality. God is perfect actuality. He's perfected and total. He is. And who he is today, he will be tomorrow. He was yesterday. He will never grow. So the word, wait, gava in Hebrew means eagerly waiting eagerly. The eagerness makes you run. The eagerness makes you cry. The eagerness makes you, the word means hope. So for a version of the Bible that says, for, but those who hope in the Lord. You see, God does not hope. <laughs> God does not live in the place of hope. Every time you talk about hope, you talk about imperfect situation. Hope means expecting what you desire. Why are you expecting it's not yet here? And there's nothing you can do about it. You just have to wait for it to come. So somebody is pregnant for three months. The family is excited, but the family is waiting. And the family is hoping. Especially the family, though, they, they want a baby girl so badly because everybody in the family is boy, 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 boy. They want a baby boy because everybody's girl. So there's nothing they can do about it. They just have to wait for pregnancy to be mature at the end of it and see what comes. So in the day of scan, you can check. And sometimes in scan, things are hidden from the eyes of the scan. And so you, we are not too sure. This baby does not give us opportunity to see through this and that. So let's wait. This is not about the baby. The baby is already there. It's about you and you can do nothing about it. So God is already God. Say God is already God. And there's nothing you can do about it. So the waiting is not about God to get ready. The waiting is your eagerness in expectation. When you are eagerly expecting something, you can adjust. When you are eagerly expecting something, you can stay all nights without sleep. When you are eagerly waiting for something, you can do additional research and study. When you are eagerly, so the eagerness and the hope on the side of the one who waits on the Lord or waits for the Lord speaks to the preparation, the maturity and the growth that is required for the one who waits to grow into, to walk and transition into what God is and what God has done for a person. So most of the time, we don't take responsibility for a situation of just, well, I'm waiting on the Lord. I'm just, shut up. Don't say that again. You're waiting for you to grow. You're waiting for you to transition. You're waiting for you to be mature enough to move from infancy of just drinking milk to the maturity of cracking bones and walking in your inheritance. For as long as the child, the heir, the one who will take over the throne of the father, as long as he's an infant, somebody else will rule. On behalf of the infant, which is why we have so many believers, but they are infants. And there are many doctrines that enable you and make you very comfortable being infants. Because infants don't take responsibilities for their failure. Infants, they poo poo, but they don't, they don't war wash. They just poo poo, but they don't war wash. Even to change diaper, bah, bah, infants will cry. Come on, we just want to help you now. You keep quiet. What is this nonsense about being infant? So everything that should change your life is everything you resist and fight against. Because you are infant, you can have seven children and the oldest is 30 years old. And you are an infant baby father who knows nothing. You can be a mother. You no longer expect a child because you are in your menopause zone. And yet you are no older than the least of your children while you are in the infancy in the spiritual realm. And in that case, is an infant taking care of infant. Your inheritance is taken care of by the mature. And let's hope it's not the devil that runs deal on your behalf. So what God wants us to do is to begin to teach us things that will mature us. I hope you are ready. Are you ready? 
That's what led me to that Isaiah chapter 40 verse 30. Those who wait on the Lord. We are not waiting for the Lord to grow. We are waiting in growth. So that we can become what God says. Rise to your feet. Rise to your feet and lift up your two hands. Drop everything. Say, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. I'm, I, I didn't hear you. Rise and lift up your two hands and speak with a voice that rises like the stars. The star of the rising star. Say, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. I am not afraid of growth. I'm not afraid of maturity. I'm not afraid of seniority. I am not afraid of increasing. Say, I'm not afraid of taking responsibility. Of being in the place of choosing rights. I'm paying the price for my choices. Say, Lord, I am not afraid of paying the price of being an adult. In Jesus' name. Be seated. There is a young girl that I adopted at the age of two and a half. I saw her for the last time, after a very long time, during the white worship party. She came in. She's now a stranger to me and it's just such a strange thing and I'm just praying very hard for her. I met her at the age of two and a half years. I've talked about the story. She had been part of my life for such a long time, since 2006. So for about 18 years or so, she's been part of my life. At two and a half years, in the first place that I was a parish priest, the, the parish of um, this evangelist, um, Chris. Chris, where are you, Chris Morris? So Chris, Chris, okay, Chris is in the media. I'm sure you know Chris. You know Mary Chris. He has had a village of a marriage. So this two and a half year old saw me and saw the first day I came to celebrate mass in the parish and told the mom, me farago, farago jio. He said, that farago jio, ayayao, me mayo, nyaka, mbrenye, two and a half years old. This father is so fine. I love him. I want to go to him. So she came to me and the mother said, this is what this is. And I, we clicked, connected. I celebrated our third birthday, and I still have the photograph. Over the years, I'll show her a photograph, and we will laugh, and laugh, and laugh, and laugh, and laugh. When she turned about 13, 14, 15, we had a convention. We're having convention. We grew together for many years. Now, she was now a, she was now a teenager, like a 14, 15, so I asked her, What's the greatest experience of transitioning from the two and a half year old that I saw to the adolescent? She said, the problem of expectation. The weight of expectation. That when she was younger, not many things were expected of her. And so she just lived her life but now. She's aware of expectation. She has to do this and do this, pass her exam. She has to do this and do this. She has to fit in here. She has to fit in here. And the pressure is just increasing and increasing. She has to cook. She has to wash. She has to clean up. She has to. <laughs> so the problem she had, and she's very articulate, very intelligent, very, very intelligent. Wow. The responsibility of growing up. Which is why it's comfortable to be to remain a two and a half year old till you die. I just want you to think about this. I love true life stories, and I just tell you a few things. Haven't you been scared of growing up into taking responsibility for a life that is righteous and holy, a life that is disciplined and orderly, a life that is productive and effective, a life that is excellent and intentional? It costs everything. Which is why certain people, no matter how much they fast and pray, there is no chance for them to become anything more than what they are. They can't just pay the price of growing up. And so if the one who, do, who cannot pay the price of growing up refuses to grow up, and the things that he needs to grow up into in order to enjoy, he cannot access them. He says, I'm waiting on the Lord. Isn't that a lie? God has been waiting on you. 
God has been waiting for you to know certain things and to walk in the certain things that you know in order to enjoy the portion of your inheritance that is currently inaccessible to you. At every point in time, there are things that belong to you that are not available to you. Isn't that paradoxical or ironical that things that are yours are not available to you? How do you understand that they are yours, but they are not available to you? Wow. It contradicts. They are mine, gift to me, but they are not accessible. They are not available for you even though they are yours because you've not attained the age. So you can see a man and say, I'm 36. Why are you not married? I'm waiting on the Lord. Shut up. You don't know. You're still wearing diaper. Still wee wee in your diaper and you smell around. You are so irresponsibly, disgracefully irresponsible that the thought of somebody sharing life with you will cause heaven to panic. Look at somebody. Just look at intention. Now don't smile without expression. Just turn around look at someone. If it's your husband, turn around look at someone. I said, don't look at me. Look at somebody looking at me. I might be somebody here talking. If I wanted you to look at me, I would have said, look at me. Now look at somebody around you. Ask somebody, how old are you? Okay, can we do a brief teaching this morning? We have been talking about intentionality. Write it down again. Intentionality, chapter 3. Spiritual intentionality, chapter 3. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask. Let the light of your glory shine so powerfully. Let your glory radiate so mightily. Let your joy be so glorious that your word will never be resisted. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Be seated. I'm trying to control so many words. I don't want to over talk. God told me something. So today in this service and the family service, we are changing the game. We are still dealing with spiritual intentionality, the urgency and the importance of spiritual intentionality, the desperate, important, urgent, the desperate, urgent, and important, or the, the desperate urgency and importance of spiritual, spiritual intentionality. But today I want to introduce something while we talk about spiritual intentionality, I want to talk about the mystery of the firstborn. These are teachings that are deep, that will take you not six feet down, but ages down. It will take you not nine feet up, but heavenly up. That will expand you and mature you. Stay with me. The mystery of the firstborn. When I talk about mystery, we're talking about things that are coded, embedded in, on the, on, in the unknown. When I'm talking to Rising Stars Assembly, I know there are so many of you, most of you are people who have capacity to understand me so I can express myself. So coded, coded means it is coded. In the intelligence community, The language is about code and symbol. So you can intercept a letter, but you don't know what that letter is. You must be schooled in the arts of coded language in order to decode and analyze. So that's mystery. That means where there is mystery, there has to be revelation. Revelation is the spiritual interpretation or decoding of the coded language of mystery. Mystery dwells in the unknown. Revelation drags mystery to the known and makes mystery a reality to be lived. I've talked about mystery. Let's talk about firstborn. Firstborn is just about first. Say first. Are you writing down things? Sir? If you don't write, you commit sin against this moment. So I don't want to talk about firstborn. Later on, I will say something about that. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22 to 24. Please follow me. The Holy Spirit says, I should not be emotional today. 
I should not be very charismatic today. I should teach you. The Holy Spirit is, has been waiting for you to rise because your star has gone forth. That your star has risen doesn't mean you will rise. There are too many people whose stars have gone forth several years ago. And they are a million miles away from becoming. And they die and they are buried. If you go to the cemetery, the cemetery is the wealthiest place on earth. Books that were never written and will never be written, buried. Songs that were never composed and will never be composed. Inventions that never came to light and nobody will ever enjoy. Technology that will never change life. Signs that will never bless life. The cemetery is a place of useless glory. In the ancient Egypt, all the kings and the nobles and the mighty were buried with their gold, with wealth. So the robbing of tomb started in Egypt. <laughs> they discovered that the wealthiest place in Egypt was a tomb. When a king died, an entire generation of wealth had to be buried with a king. Till today, archaeologists are still looking for tombs in Egypt. The hidden wealth. The problem is that our own is not the gold that somebody, if we dig into graves of our fathers and we can take anything tangible, just see rotten bone. But in those bones lie gold. The wealth that never came to pass. I don't know what this means to you. The Holy Spirit is just telling me to speak words. I pray in the name of Jesus that your wealthiest life will not be in the grave. Amen. My hope is that I will be totally empty by the time God calls me home. And there will be nothing left. That's my prayer. So when I show up today, I want to finish with the business of today. That's why I talk for a long time. I find it difficult if I have three words that I should say one. Just feel like I should, I should spit them out. I don't want to die with anything valuable. I want to die empty. Lift up your two hands. I pray in the name of Jesus that your wealthiest life will not be in the grave. Amen. I pray for every one of you that everything that God sent you to deliver on earth, you will fully deliver them. Amen. And when you are buried in the tomb, there will be no reason to rob your tomb. Amen. In Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 22 to 24. Isn't this why I need an entire day to teach? There's so much. Hebrews chapter 12, verses, verse 22 to 24. Listen to this. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to. When you have been delivered, for many of you, this scripture has not yet applied to you because you have not yet come. So this scripture is talking first of all to those who have been delivered. It's going to talk about the church. The church is ecclesia. Ecclesia means those called out. You cannot come until you are called out, until you accept being called out of former things, former places and former lives, former experiences and expression. So that you are in church today doesn't mean you are part of church. You can say, I'm a member of GFCC, I'm family. I see people, I'm family. I'm family. Which family are you talking about? GFCC. You can be the president of GFCC and you did not come. The scripture is talking about, you have come to. You have come means you have left. Until you have left, you cannot come. If you have not left Lagos, we cannot tell you in Aquaibum State, welcome to Aquaibum State. If we do that, we are using data. And using technology that you are stuck in the airport of Lagos and doing presentations. You say, Welcome to Uyo, because you can see somebody via video link in Uyo. It is just technology. If the person wants to use the toilet, he will not use toilet in Uyo. He will say, Sorry, please hold on, let me use the restroom. And where is the restroom? Not in Uyo. So when you tell somebody who is in Lagos airport, Welcome to Uyo, you are a fool. You have not come to Uyo because you have not left Lagos. So this scripture, don't be delighted that this scripture is being read today. The first thing you should find out is whether you have left. 
because you will not come. You will not be among those who have come until you have left. Ask somebody, have you left? Where have you left? When did you leave? Yes, if you ask Paul, he will tell you, I left. And he will tell you when he left. But you have come to Mount Zion. For those who have left, and today by the grace of God, there will be opportunity for somebody to leave. Oh, praise God, I thought it would be exciting. I said there will be opportunity for somebody to leave. Leave, like move away. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God. You have come to the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to an innumerable company of angels. Until you have left, you will not come to the company of the angels. So you see people come to the company of men. They quarrel with men in church and move from one church to another. They hold things against pastors and ministers and talk about why they left that church and love they left that church. Did you see the angels there? No. You saw men because you didn't leave. You had not left. Because you have not left spiritually, so you keep living physically. I've seen people come to GFCs who have refused to leave their pride and their arrogance. And so when issues come up and their prides are broken and then bruised, their ego bruised and wounded and insulted, then they leave. So I'm no longer going there as if it changes anything for me. As if it makes me smaller and shorter, it keeps you proud and hopeless and without a future except there is a change. So we pastors, we are always in a hurry to celebrate so those who come to church for the first time, find out from them, why did you leave where you left? You left there because you had finished with the angels there, and the angels there had finished lifting you, and there is no space for your lifting. Or you left because you did not see angels, you saw men and quarrel with men and quarrel with women. And then you are moving into this place. Have you come here to meet the heavenly Jerusalem? How will you meet the heavenly Jerusalem when you are not yet done with the earthly one? I pray in the name of Jesus that today something will happen to your soul and you will leave. And so your journey of destiny will begin. In Jesus' name. The Holy Spirit says I should bring you words. I hope you are hearing words. You need to live. What life is waiting for you to leave in order to come. And many parents who have not left and yet cannot arrive and their children are expecting people who have come and they leave their children in the mid middle of the womb neither in pregnancy nor in birth in the middle but you have come to the heavenly Jerusalem to an innumerable company of angels you have come to the general assembly read the rest Come on, come on, come on. Read it like it is your own. And church of what? Oh. The church of what? Give us that scripture in NIV. You have come to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written where? Names not written in F E G F C C. Father, in the name of, can you rise and speak in the Holy Spirit? Just rise. Lift up your two hands. Just speak in the Holy. Just speak in any language. Say, Lord, cause me to come. Cause me. Bring me out from things, life lifestyle, attitude, disposition, realities, generations that have kept me away from coming into the heavenly place. Labosh and Let Lord, let your word excavate men from hundred millions of years of backwardness. Let your word forward men and women into the contemporary the, con the contemporary stage of your grace take us to where your grace is now take us bring us to the language of your the now language of grace speak in the holy grace say lord take me from 
the years pass into the years now. Lord, cause wombs. Let the wombs of life be open and let destinies emerge. Lord, let the womb of darkness be open and let light come shining. Let the wombs of delay be open and let men and women emerge in speed. And let the wombs of diseases and sickness be open and let health be released. I speak in the Holy Ghost that the name of Jesus will bring you out. Bring you out from the water place, from the dry place, from the sandy, rocky place. And from the hanging, delaying place. Latum and the prakata I speak in the name of Jesus. Lamonda talabroli kateanda. I speak in the name of Jesus Christ. Glory be Jesus. Glory be to Jesus. Be seated in the name of Jesus. You say you have come to the church of the firstborn, the general assembly. I love it in New King James Version. You go. Welcome to the, you have come to the general assembly, the plenary assembly, which is the church. And where everyone, that church, everyone is firstborn. This is where we will end that reading and move on. So, when we are talking about firstborn, before we dig into the scripture, let me just give you specific words. Seven words that will help you understand the mystery of the firstborn. Are you ready? Seven, seven words. Take them down. Take them. Read. Write them immediately. Number one is prominence. These seven words will help you to understand what it means to be firstborn in the biblical terms. When we are talking about the firstborn, it's not firstborn in, in the natural realm. We are talking about the church where everybody is firstborn. We are talking about firstborn as a mystery. We are talking about firstborn as what needs revelation for you to understand. So don't tell me of your birth position in the family. Don't tell me after all you are the only child in your own family. You don't even need a second born. There is no way I am the only born. Sorry. It's because you have not yet come. By the grace of God you are coming. You will come. So number one thing about firstborn is prominence. Have you written prominence? Say check. Have you written prominence? Check. Number two, preeminence. Preeminence. You go into your dictionary and check. Look out all this. Look up all these words. Look up all these words. Check them. Prominence. Preeminence. This it it is on you now to find out the meaning, the detail. Go to Thesaurus. Go to dictionary and know the meaning of prominence. A prominent personality talks about important one who is unique and celebrated among others a prominent member of the church a prominent preeminence preeminence they belong to the same place but with different nuances with different shades of meaning of meaning you check it. excellence the third word is excellence please write it when the word of God says, welcome to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn. It means the church where everyone is firstborn. So there is no church in the, meaning, in the understanding of God. If you ask Jesus what church is, he will tell you it's the fellowship of those that everyone in that fellowship is firstborn. It means everybody is prominent. Everybody enjoys preeminence. It means Satan honors and reveres and hates them so much. Because the devil does not hate common things. The devil hates uncommon, uncommon people. The devil loves mess. So the church is not the fellowship of messed up people. Messed up people are in church for them to be initiated into the, to be registered in heaven. So there is a church of men, ordinary men. But the church of the ordinary men is cooking and preparing people to be transitioned and translated into the spiritual church. Where everyone is preeminent in honor. It's prominent. 
in distinction, excellent in expression. Number four, priority, priority. The word aeon in Greek, <laughs> aeon in Greek talks about, sometimes it talks about even leader, it talks about the aged, it talks about ancient, prior things that existed prior to now, something that is older, something that is greater, something that has lasted longer. So the firstborn is the one who enjoys priority. And when we are talking priority, before things became messy, they had been there. Before things, before this and that. So they are men of bones and substance. They are not children. Children don't have priority. They don't have preeminence. They drink milk. They cannot be considered for serious meeting when you want to have a very serious meeting that would change the systems of life. You don't look for diaper-wearing babies and infants. You look for men of priority, those who give priority to. Priority invitation. It means if the hall is full, we will empty the hall to make sure you are seated. When you have priority booking in an aircraft, it means if it is full, some people will have to be paid to stand down for you to sit down. Because you enjoy priority. Why? You are preeminent in expression. You are prominent in disposition. You belong to the weight and the heaviness of life. You matter and you are weighty. That means you can be equal to Nations. This is why God visited Egypt. And when God wanted to punish Egypt, he did not, he did not set their houses on fire. He did not burn their temples. He killed their firstborn. Why? Those who were prominent and preeminent and priority had positions and disposition and, and occupied the place of priority in the thinking and the thought of God had been enslaved for years. And Pharaoh had been arrogant enough to ask, who is the God that will deliver you from it? Who is this God that is telling you to go? Okay, because there is a God who deceives you, increase their burden. And God says, no, I'm going to take Pharaoh gently. When I'm done with Pharaoh, I've told you a couple of times that I had to do a little bit of studies in, on Egypt, Egyptology. And it's discovered that a king that probably was in the time of Exodus was Ramsey. Because the people of Israel, the built Ramesses, one of the places they were built, Ramesses and Peter. And Ramesses, kings in Egypt used to build cities and name after themselves. So Ramesses is perhaps the city of Ramsey. And it is recorded that Ramsey had misfortune of unequal proportion in Egypt, such that he did not have successor that was his child. Why? His firstborn had been killed. <laughs> that means if you joke with the one that has priority in the plan of God, that enjoyed prominence in the history of God, and that enjoyed preeminence, in the economy and the arrangement of God, God is not going to come after your house. God is not going to come. God comes after you that you don't exist after that. He takes away your firstborn. Why? Firstborn is the one who sits on the stool of the, seat of the king when the king is absent. So God is betting those who will sit on his table on earth. And the church is where the gathering of the firstborn is. Where the knowledge and the mindset of the firstborn is translated into the mind. So that you can live above your family status. In India, they talk about curse, the caste system. In Igbo, they talk about Osu. <laughs> so in Igbo land, in Osu, certain families cannot marry certain families because certain Osu curse are required, are regarded to be inferior, not worthy of anything prominent. In Indian society, there are Different curse. So people of the higher curse, they cannot come down to marry with those at the lower level. It means some people in the society enjoy preeminence, prominence and priority. So when people of the inferior curse, they meet those at the higher level, 
Nobody tells them to step back. They scale down and step back for others to pass. And to be a child of God is to be scaled up and to be escalated in the plan of God. Say escalation. <laughs> Did you know, sir, that being in church is not showing up on Sunday morning? It's living in a life of priority, prominence, excellence, preeminence, such that who jokes with you, God goes after the firstborn because you are the firstborn. Tit for that. Those who use God to joke, take notes. Those who use the things of God to make no, to joke and just make mess of it, take note. Because God is fearful. Just want to share a few things. God said, take them deeper and higher. Let's escalate this thing. Let's move this thing just from a place of empty, empty, empty excitement into changing life. This house is a furnace where God turns ordinary people in and takes them into a place where they can enjoy divine superiority. So another word for firstborn is superiority. 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 Superiority complex is negative, but superiority in life is what it should be. Being superior, that you move into the place of darkness where everyone there groans, where everyone there considers the greatest misfortune to be there. And because of your superiority, you till the balance in your favor. Favor, everything just changes. You sit in a place and you turn the whole thing upside down. You walk into the place and the place comes on alive. Why? There is somebody who has the priority in the mind of God. Because of that, the sun shines at midnight because the sun is required because of the priority service that is required for the one who enjoys preeminence and prominence to show excellence and to manifest in superiority so the sun can actually shine at midnight because after all the sun never sleeps when the sun sets in the east it's because the west is rising to the sun and so living priority means that the, sun, the east and the west they are in the center for you because you are the center of gravity. You are the epicenter of the happening of divinity. I don't know, am I speaking too many words? I'm just thinking you have, you have to enjoy priority. If I am too high, tell me, come down. Don't tell me, I will not come down. I talk to you like you enjoy prominence. I talk to you that after you come to church, you have to go and grow. I talk to you like you are so important that you are sitting in New York listening to me and you all have second degree from Harvard. I talk to you like you are so important that you are wearing things in your ears such that if I speak Spanish, there will be automatic translation because that is what priority service gives to you. That you go to a nation and you enjoy priority service, you enter into a bus and you have something in your ear. And somebody is speaking in another language but you are hearing another language while you are prominent. And those lives are not free, they are not cheap, they are paid for. It takes a price of maturity. And my young girl telling me, the problem of growing up is that there is too much expectation. I ask God to put burden in my heart to pray for her more. Superiority, number six, advantage. Say advantage. So firstborn, to be firstborn is to live a life of advantage. So when the scriptures say, welcome to the church, the general assembly and the church where everyone is firstborn, means God sees church as a place where all his sons and daughters enjoy advantage. Advantage that you are in a place of mess and people are crying, oh, it's too messy, we are not going to make it. You say, my case is different, I enjoy divine advantage. 
He said, oh, we are going to shut our, our churches. We are going to go down. Oh, our, many, our, our businesses are going to go down. Our offices are going to be closed down. Oh, everybody just crying about something. He said, sorry, I enjoy priority. There is always a space for us. I live a life of advantage. This is the vision of God. I'm not talking about the vision of Tinubu. I'm not talking about the economy of Nigeria. I'm not talking about the manipulation of dollars. I'm talking about the economy that nothing can be manipulated. <laughs> I was reading of something last night or yesterday that the certain countries in the world where, what is it called? Binance or Binance? Binance. Binance. It's either buy or B or the combination of two. B by Nans, right? Okay. It's banned in the UK. It's banned in the US. It's banned in very serious places. And Nigeria, they are talking about fine and they may apologize. Why? Because it's a nation of crooks. <laughs> nation where crooks are in charge. So you talk about dollar, naira, every day things are going there. You think it is just an ordinary force. There are people who are becoming trillionaires because of this mystery. I said something one day and a woman sat there and had to go after her when naira began to get artificial scarcity. And I said this thing is the collaboration of those with POS and um, business, private businesses in giving out money and bankers. And the banker said, you know, I see, don't you dare not say that before me. How dare you say it? Later on, federal government said it was true. Because he made money, made people billionaires overnight. Bankers hiring money and making money available to those others with interest and they go sell. And so when they were expecting that during Christmas, things will just go that way and all that, they hoarded money. And I told her, and the woman that is so close to me, I said, you dare not say it. I will not come and stand here and talk nonsense. By that time, I didn't read it on any newspaper. I just knew by common sense that those who profited from that first time, they are preparing to profit. Nigeria is a place where people can allow the father's head to be stolen as long as he makes money out of it. So he's ready to bury the father without a head. It's a nation without value. Their only value is money. So doctors can kill their patients as long as it makes money. Fake drugs are everywhere and people know these are fake drugs. But they must be sold for people to die. And burial is so expensive because it's a big business. That is why the church is in desperate need for emergence. God, God's hope and trust is that the church will be the church of his vision. Not the church of useless doctrines one making one superiority not spiritual superiority of a superior life that you live that the enemy fears and that changes things around you but a life because your papa has authentic teaching and it's teaching you maturity maturity that makes you live a, a life of lameness and brings no honor upon your life from the spiritual realm God is thinking about a church where all his children will enjoy priority service God is thinking about a church where all those who gather will enjoy preeminence and prominence. That it will be such a great thing to do business with somebody and he's a church person. He said, the way I look at you, you don't look like a Nigerian businessman. He said, I'm called out. He said, tell me what you mean by you are called out. I'm of the church of the firstborn. We enjoy excellence as a lifestyle. He said, well, I don't believe in God, but I just, I believe in you. And it's okay. So let your light so shine. So that men seeing your good work, they will do what? Give glory. So by believing in you, they are giving credit to the one who made you. The scriptures say we are the workmanship. A workmanship, do you know what that means? Workmanship. We are what he has worked out. And so to know his excellence, you look at us. We are, we are the intention, we are the, we are the end point, the end result of his dexterous, intentional, artful engagement. So when people look at us, how intricately beautiful and excellent we are, 
He said, you're not just, are you a Nigerian? He said, yes, but the way you do business, the honesty, the integrity, the excellence that you bring in your service delivery and all that, you don't just look like you fit into this climb. He said, do I leave you? I'm not of this world. I'm of the church of the firstborn. Is that a church you have always known? Is that a church that somebody can run away from? So when people move from church to church, is that what they move from? So people are searching for church then. And a lot of people are afraid of entering into church. Because they don't want to lose their diapers. They don't want to lose their mess. Do you think it's cheap to be excellent? If you teach rats, rats will say honorable. Just take time out and teach rat over time. They can pronounce excellent. Sorry. God said let's, let's scale down from the emotional charismatic thing and touch base with reality. Advantage. Number six. Number seven. Number seven. Number seven. Above. Above. That's where we end. So the seventh thing that firstborn brings as a package is above. A life that is above. The scripture says the one who comes from above is above all. He said he came to his own but his own did not accept him. They do not believe in him but even those who, those who accept him, those who do believe in him, to them he gives power to become sons. Those born not of the, the will of man, not born of the will of man, natural desire but born of God. First John, who were born not of blood, not of the will of the flesh, not of the will of man but of what? That means born above. So what God, took, what God calls church, those who are called out, is the church of those who are born from above, who are above all. And because they are above all, they have advantage. Because they are above all, they have priority. Because they are above all, they have enjoy excellence, live excellence. Because they are above all, they enjoy priority. They enjoy preeminence and prominence. That's the seven code and connections of the firstborn. Can I tell you why these seven words Describe firstborn. Are you still with me? Okay, shall we say now the day is over? <laughs> because the way you are looking at me, say we have been here for too long. Let's sing. Now the day is. That was my best time in school, in primary school. <laughs> Honorable Commissioner, was that also your best time? No, you didn't go to school in my village. People went to school in nursery school. and <laughs> You don't understand school that I'm talking about. So the best time in my school was when brang, 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 brang. And the person who would start this song does not know the meaning of anyone. Now the day is over. I take what belongs to me is over. Why do we have seven words to describe the church? The church of the firstborn. Go back to that Hebrews chapter 12. Verse 23 to the general, welcome to the general assembly and church. Welcome to the church of the firstborn. Say firstborn. firstborn. Who are registered where? They are known in the heavenly. The devil hates them because they are known in high places. They attract the attention of evil. They are tempted. If you have been tempted seriously, it's because your star has gone forth. And perhaps, you know, when we talk about temptation, it's not everybody that is tempted. Or there are those who are tempters and there are those who are tempted. The tempted are those who are registered in heaven. The tempters are those who go against them to bring them down from heaven. Two people may make the same mistake. One is tempted. The other one is the tempter. Exodus chapter 22 will let you know why seven words describe the, the firstborn, which is the fellowship that is called church. Exodus 22 verse 29. We are almost done. Praise God. I say praise God. Exodus chapter 22 verse 29. Glory to God. 
Can you rise before we read that scripture? Can you rise to your feet? Say, I enjoy priority. I enjoy priority. I live the life of God's superiority. I belong to his preeminent life. I am prominent. Say, I live divine advantage. Excellence is my nature. I am born from above. Say, I enjoy advantage. Because I am God's above. I live in superiority because I enjoy God's priority list. Say, I am excellent in preeminence because I'm prominent. I am God's firstborn. Is that true? Well, whether it is true in actual fact or true in anticipation, it is true. Because that's the plan of God for you. No matter who you are right now, no matter who you have been, this message is not condemnation. This message is revelation for you to know whom God sees you as and what God wants to make you into. Regardless of your condition, regardless of your history, say, I enjoy priority. I cannot suffer the fate of everybody. I enjoy preeminence because I'm God's prominent one. Say, I live in his advantage because I am above, superior in his priority. Excellence is my name. Why am I saying all this? I'm God's firstborn. We could make that trend, hashtag. We can make a t-shirt. can make t-shirts for the the rising stars assembly because we are going to stay we can we're going to stay on this on this process on this particular series for long maybe as long as three weeks or four weeks so we can begin to talk around i leave it in the hands of my my divisional commander of the air of zion walk out things and see how we make a dress code god's firstborn and then you choose the one you enjoy among all of this, whether it's priority, whether it's superiority, whether it's preeminence, whether it's prominence, whether it's advantage or above, whatever one, whichever one. My own may not have to be your own. Tell somebody the one that is your own in all of this. Yeah, take some time out and gossip. Do you know I am superior? Say, oh, sorry, don't look at the way I dress. Sorry, please, don't look at the way I dress. Tell somebody, pardon my dressing, please. And pardon my looks, please. It's just that that is who God says I am. It's not my fault. Should I apologize? Glory. Walk that out and then come and consult me on which one is mine. I say all of the seven. Glory. So I can turn each of these into stamp. Do we still have stamp? So you do something like stamp that can carry all of this. So you have a shape design that has stamp like stamp. You see? Now, now, now. Now listen, if I told you that I'm a creative director, will you accept it? Yeah. So you just say, oh, that man speaks in tongues. He doesn't understand anything about creativity. Because we belong above. We mourn on more higher, higher, higher. Sincerely. So we go and research on stamp. Every stamp carries something. So if you have the seven stamp on your shirt and on, on your stuff, and somebody is now curious to see what is the other stamp, what is the other stamp, superiority, what is the other stamp, priority, and you tell somebody we many, if a, if a demonized man will dare say, my name is Legion, because we are many, what should I say? <laughs> my name is Super Legion. 
I many in God. How dare you think I'm just a preacher? I'm not. I'm God's priority service. I carry the fullness of his expression. I am anything every time he wants it. Exodus chapter 22, before I forget my name. Exodus chapter 22, verse 29. You shall not delay to offer the first of your ripe produce and your juices. The firstborn of your sons. Read that. This is why we use these seven words to describe. These seven words do not say everything about the firstborn. The one who belongs to God enjoys priority. So I was not talking nonsense. I was not doing self-help talk. I was not doing fake it until you make it psychology. God said the firstborn, the firstborn, of your son shall be mine, shall be given to me. Let's keep from Old Testament into New Testament. The New Testament talks about it in Colossians, that in Christ there is neither male nor female. So when God is talking about firstborn, he's not talking about maleness or femaleness. God is talking about status and stature. God is talking about nature. And God is talking about revelation. That the one who belongs to God has a nature of eminence, of prominence, and priority, and, promi and preeminence, and, and advantage, and above, and superiority, and priority. Why? They belong to God. It does not matter whether they are girls or boys. So it's an insult to look down on the fact that you have all girls. How dare you think because God gave you all girls, then God made mistakes. That God was asleep. In his eyes, they are supposed to be all firstborn. That means walk them up into the place of the life of priority, of prominence, of superiority. So what God is looking at in my face is not the contour of my face, the, the sharpness and the pointedness or the bluntness of my nose. God is looking out to looking out to see his nature in me, which is this nature that will give me priority, his nature that will give me preeminence, his nature that will make me prominent, his nature that will give me advantage and make me above and make me excellent. Why? Firstborn a DNA thing. God says, these ones belong to me. Look at that scripture in NIV. Come on, run with me. In NIV, he said, do not hold back offerings from your granaries or your vats. You must give me the firstborn of your, of what? Your sons. Give me the firstborn, all that opens the womb among your sons. This is the Old Testament that spoke in shades and coats. That spoke in ah, passiveness and... Ah, not in completeness. But in the New Testament, it's perfect. Now, do you know what? Do you know why seven words describe the firstborn? Do you know why? Do you know why? You don't know. It is because the firstborn belongs to God. So God is saying, Welcome to a church where everyone in that church belongs to me. <laughs> and because everyone in that church belongs to me, I can go to war over them. Somebody in infant, my sister in law saw a brother in law she did not know she had. Something happened one of these days while still on holiday. Through the generosity of the loving people around me, you put me in an icon hotel and I refused to leave the place. And my son suggested we should give out our house to another person so that we move permanently. <laughs> so I, when I recovered enough, I took my children to school every day by the grace of God and bring them back. One of those mornings, I dropped the children and my last born, uh, uh, my, my youngest one, amazing friend of mine, an amazing body. So we were going together. And suddenly somebody from a company, I don't want to, drove carelessly, just put his, his vehicle just in front of me. And he was on this, this lane, this highway, so to say. 
and he just and so suddenly they break and my son tumbled oh I didn't know I had rich inside I flapped him down and said boy wait something don't happen and he thought I was joking so he started going towards their company I followed him and I was so close to him because I had worked in a security place I used to man the gate I know they will not allow me to enter so what I did is that boot to you know bomba to bomba <laughs> so if you're allowing him in you must allow me in there's no way I entered and they started I came I didn't I cried I was so emotional I was so angry how dare you my son could tumble and break his spine my how dare you do you have a wife have you ever had a son and that's I, I, I grew mad in less than 15 minutes I lost all the senses because my son's life he was not injured, just that I saw him in trauma. And the trauma left a mark that I could not, the whole day I couldn't recover from it. And I discover that the day you want to know whether somebody is weak or strong, touch what belongs to them. <laughs> and somebody said, I know you, I follow you, you are my pastor. Say, am I your pastor? I say, yes. I say, bring him here, let me tell him something. <laughs> He said, it's not a matter of forgiveness. I just, I just wanted to let him know that my son had an experience and I saw what I don't want to see as a father. And I just wanted to consure him that every morning you wake up, your carelessness can kill a, a family, can make a father heartbroken for life and can make a son paralyzed for life. Please, sir, if you have not yet had children, please be careful. There are people's children on the road and there are people's husbands and wives and fathers and mothers. And please just be careful, sir. That's all I wanted, just to let him know so that next time he doesn't make that mistake. But because he didn't trust me enough, I show up in their company and I caused a sin. I caused a very big sin. I said, okay, I'll take the number of your boss and call you and call him and I will know what to say. All of you, I, I did, I, before I say, same book. No, no, no. So they said, I entered the vehicle. I had lost my emotion. I was now crying. I had to calm down and apologize. I told them because I saw my son in trauma. And I was coming to pray in this place. So I took time to ask God, God, is this how you act when somebody tries me? That's how I started prayer. It took me more than one hour to calm down. He said, God, this is how you lose your mind. So this is what made you kill the firstborn in Egypt. Because those who enjoy your prominence, your premium. Yeah. So, God, so this is, oh, is this, was it just me? Do I love my son more than you love me as your son? Then I say, God, thank you for being my father. No wonder you didn't say, God so loved the world that, you know, you, you know, look at the, the love of God for us that he has called us his, his, his uh, no, his, his drivers, his personal driver, that he has called us his children. And that's who we are. So God gets mad when his own is tampered with. So the church of the firstborn, God is saying the church is mine. The church which is the garden of everyone and everyone in that place knows me as father and I know them as my own. So the firstborn belongs to God. So do you know Jesus Christ is the firstborn? Let's leave it there. Next week, we're going to do something deep. Just one last scripture and we'll be done. Just one last scripture. So you will understand why God says, give to me the firstborn. Matthew chapter 1 verse 24 to 25. Matthew chapter 1 verse 24 to 25. Matthew chapter 1 verse 24 to 25. Then Joseph being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife. Verse 25, everyone read it. And did not know her. Read it out. Come on. One go. And did not know her till she had brought forth. Now, it's getting deeper. Every firstborn is Jesus. <laughs> it's, getting, it's getting deeper. <laughs> Every firstborn is Jesus. And Jesus is a promise. Jesus means God will save so every firstborn is an announcement and a promise to a family I will save. 
So when somebody is born again and born into the, register, the registry of God as firstborn, God has put a promise upon that family. I will change this family. Because I have found one who is in my priority list. <laughs> I will change this generation. I will change this community. Give birth to his firstborn, that one that belongs to God. And he called his name Jesus. <laughs> this is why the devil hates the church. Sir, when you are born again, your name is Jesus and Herod knows your star has gone forth. <laughs> This is why intentionality in living is the only way. So Jesus cannot live at any how. The one who will save the family cannot live anyhow. The one who is the hope of a generation cannot be caught up in any how of that generation. The one who will make a difference in a time cannot be carried away by the things of the time. So the one who will cause the answer to come for the prayers of others cannot be like everyone who prays. His firstborn is called Jesus. And the church is the gathering of Jesus. Those who are named in the name of the Lord. Sir, God takes you seriously. Sir, you are the hope of this generation. Sir, please listen to what I'm going to teach. Get the message that I'm going to teach in the next service. Because it's getting deeper. It's not a continuation. I tell you, I don't do part one and part two in another service. These are different streams, but revealing the Christ ultimately. Will you rise to your feet? What's your name? <laughs> before you tell me Okoro, before you tell me Toyin, before you tell me Amba, tell me, are you firstborn? Do you belong to God? Is your name registered in heaven? If it is so, then your name is Jesus. <laughs> Then you are the salvation of God in this generation. You are the hope that God will change things in politics. You are the hope of those in their office. Sir, your name is Jesus. What is Jesus? God will save. <laughs> that God will save this generation because I'm born in the priority list of God. That my children's case will be different because I, as a mother, I am firstborn and I'm registered in heaven. I have advantage. I am born in the order of church. The scripture talks about it in Hebrews in chapter 1. That is the express image of the Father, sir. We are made in his image. We are his workmanship. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lift up your two hands, please. Hallelujah. Just lift up your two hands. Call Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The reason why Herod wanted to kill him is because he will save. The reason why your star annoys the devil is because God will use you to save. God will use you to change. You are born in the pattern of Jesus. You are born in the ownership of the Father. You are born in the priority list of the divine. You are God's Jesus on earth. You are a salvation told to a generation. You are a salvation revealed to a community. You are a salvation revealed to a family. You are a salvation in school. Lord, we praise you. Lord. Lord, we praise you. Lord, we praise you. Lord, we praise you. Lord, we praise you. Shout, you are holy. And you have made me holy. You are. You are 
have made me in your image and likeness you are you are holy you are. hands lifted eyes closed say I'm not afraid I'm not afraid to be changed I'm not afraid to leave to leave sin, to leave rebellion. I'm not afraid to leave darkness, to leave. Mention the things you live now. Say, I accept to be called out. I let go former things. I let go past. I let go. What nature in the flesh gave me? What Satan imputed in me? Say, Lord Jesus, I accept your status in my life. I accept your nature. I give my life to you. I surrender right now. I repent of my sin. Let salvation happen to me as a miracle. Say, Lord Jesus, come into this life. I renew my dedication. Every child of God, renew your consecration. Repent of every mistake, every missteps. Everyone who's coming to Christ for the first time, submit, submit, submit. Repent and submit. Say, Lord Jesus, come into my life. You're my salvation. You're my forgiveness. You're my justification. Say, I accept you. I surrender my will to you. Take my will. Take my heart. Take my emotion. You are in the name of Jesus Christ. I will, please, I will be pleased if you can place your right hand on your forehead and all eyes closed. And if you are sick in any part of your body, you can lay the other hand there. Holy Spirit You see there is healing in the name of Jesus Holy Spirit And the Holy Spirit is the conductor The translator of the healing of Jesus to reality Holy Spirit I ask God to heal your memory and heal your mind And give you a new spirit I ask God to heal all diseases and illnesses I ask cancer to die. I ask fibroid to melt. I ask death to die. I ask shame to expire. I ask that everything, 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 everything that stands in the, against the knowledge of God, every exalted and high things be pulled down in your life. I ask fibroid to clear out. I, I ask your womb to be made comfortable and available for childbearing. I ask hormones to be balanced. I ask that your sight be restored. That your tongue be loosened. Your mind be restored. I ask that your hearing be restored. Your sight be enhanced. I ask that your pains be gone. I ask that your marriage receive a new bliss. I ask that your business will enjoy boost. I ask that your family will be restored again. In the name of Jesus Christ. Unto the Lord be the glory. Can you lift up those two hands and worship it? Wave like you worship. He has, the Lord fills you with spirit. With his spirit. The Lord inspire you with his breath. The Lord fill you with the fire of revival. Come alive as you sing. Sing it out. Come alive in your health. Come alive in prayer. Come alive in fasting. Come alive in rank. Come alive in power. Come alive in the generation of divine. Come alive in the expression of glory. Come alive in the wonder of God. In the name of Jesus Christ. 